So we are very grateful that we have an expert moderator and an expert panelist who will help us think together about culturally responsive pedagogy and critical race theory and the promises of these for our uncertain times. With that, I will turn it over to Catherine DePaula from the German Center for Innovation and Research, I hope I got that right, in New York, our sponsor, and she will introduce our moderator and our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Rose, and I hope everything is working on my end here as well. So good evening, Germany. Good day, USA. It's fantastic seeing all of you, and it's great that you're joining us. Thank you for signing up to this very, very exciting event uh, that we are very proud and happy to be part of. And also hello to all of the participants. Everybody made it into the room. And as you could follow our chat, we had a discussion going on already before the event. So it's wonderful meeting you. Um, great again seeing you, having you have us at your home, at your offices, wherever you are. My name is Catherine, as Rose said, and I'm the head of programs here at the German Center for Research and Innovation. And there are six of us in total, a brand new one opening in San Francisco all over the globe, and it's our mission to promote the cutting edge research and innovation on both sides of the Atlantic, and also to offer a platform for dialogue and discussion. And um, as, as Rose just said, I'm very proud, especially proud that the DVIH, remember it's pronounced DVIH, that's the German abbreviation, was asked to co-host uh, today's event on cultural responsive ped um, pedagogy and critical race theory, which is part of a three-part series, please check out our website for the next upcoming ones. There's one every month of, uh, with a different topic, because today, as Rose also mentioned, is uh, the date of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And this for us is our contribution, as it's also our wish, of course, and, and very important in general, to support education and prevent um, and help prevent such horrible atrocities from being committed ever again. So we're very proud of the DVH to be part of this extremely important topic, specifically that given that on both sides of the Atlantic, we see a growing need for preparing increasing culturally diverse students to become moral, creative, and also productive citizens. And this is quite a task for all of the educators that are here today and the educators to come. And I'm very delighted um, for all of us here in this space to hear from some of the best experts we could possibly find on this topic. And with that, thank you again for joining us. And I'm going to leave the stage now to Jill. Thank you. Thank you. I am Jill Koyama. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am Vice Dean and Professor of Educational Leadership and Innovation at ASU's Teachers College. I could not be happier to be here. I have read the work of this panelist and they've influenced me a great deal. Uh, I just want to note to someone that Dr. Adrian Dixon is posting in the chat and trying to, to get here. So um, I hope someone more technologically profound than me can work on that. Uh, and thank you, Rose, for the reminder about being civil. I'm sure that was mostly for me. And so with that, I would ask the scholars on the panel to please introduce yourselves and also just to talk about how your scholarship and work and thinking relates to today's topic. Kevin, could I start with you? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jill, so much for having me. Uh, my name is Kevin Henry, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis. Um, my work is interested in power, essentially. I'm interested in how power works and how power operates. And more precisely, I'm interested in the ways that white supremacy often thwarts and um, challenges educational opportunities uh, for African-American students, as well as other students of color. And more specifically, that looks at, um, I look at charter schools and school choice policy. And um, I think about this through the lens of critical race theory, which often helps me to disentangle, dismantle, and challenge uh, racism in schools and policy. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Lisa, could you say a few words? Your work has influenced my thinking about refugee education so much. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, my name is Lisa Damaschke Dietrich, and I am a lecturer and researcher of political science at the University of Tübingen, which is located in the southwest of Germany. And before I came here in 2020, I was actually a professor for comparative and international education at, the, at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania in the US. So 
Um, in my research, I focus on education policies and practices um, for refugees and immigrant students in a comparative and international perspective. And I actually do this research in collaboration um, with an international interdisciplinary research group. And I think um, this research fits very well with today's topic because we compare um, different levels from policies to institutions to teachers and we look at the preparations to support um, refugee and immigrant students. Um, we have conducted interviews and, and distributed surveys and, and talked to um, educators, principals, but also uh, non-state actors that are involved. And um, as I said, I think it fits well with today's topic because in order to have a prepared institutions and educators, it is crucial that, you know, policies, institutions, and everyone is aware of the challenges that arise due to, for example, identity or cultural issues, along with issues that can relate to language barriers or also trauma, especially when you have students um, that's experienced flight or violence. So I'm excited to be here today and think about it more today from a German perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Adrian, if we could hear from you, uh, your work I was introduced to by Kevin Henry, and honestly, I just can't get enough. Good afternoon. Um, can everybody see me? I feel like I might be invisible. Um, so I'm here. Um, uh, my name is Adrian Dixon. I am a professor of critical race theory and education policy at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I um, Early in my career, started studying uh, at the classroom level, um, teaching and learning, and I used, I was interested in kind of how did uh, culturally relevant pedagogy, pedagogical practices manifest um, in teaching. And then um, Katrina happened, and uh, I was interested in kind of what would a culturally relevant pedagogy look like in a context where both teachers and students experienced a similar trauma and um, tried to launch my project and saw that the, the landscape in New Orleans had changed, the education landscape had changed dramatically. Um, I had been a teacher there, my children had gone to school there, my family had gone to school there and everything that was familiar became quickly unfamiliar and inaccessible. And uh, that was in 2007 and it kind of launched now what has been a, a uh, long, 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 longitudinal study on um, kind of how, how uh, communities are experiencing ed reform. Um, and I'm, I'm most interested in kind of how communities remake um, their or maintain their cultural practices and cultural identities in the context of education reform and specifically in New Orleans, but I, I'm, I'm interested in these places where Black people live and try to educate their children. Um, I do this um, primarily through a, a critical race theory lens um, and also thinking about kind of how uh, vulnerable populations uh, by gender um, experience this. And so I draw on Black feminist theories um, as well. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And yes, we can absolutely see you. Now, I think that was my error. I try uh, to work across three screens, but apparently not very effectively. Uh, Maria, so I'm interested to hear about your work. I, I have, we haven't met and, and I'm interested to know what you're doing and how you bring a new lens to this conversation. Thank you, Jill. And um, thank you, Annika, also for um, inviting me here to this very exciting and uh, very interesting panel um, talking about um, um, indeed the, the uncertainties that we are living in right now. I'm a professor at the Alice Salomon University for Applied Science in Berlin. And um, I'm focusing in my research um, more theoretically on education. So I'm not doing um, empirical studies um, on education. I do empirical studies, but uh, right now I'm working on conspiracy theories, which might be also interesting interesting for this conversation here right now, when we talk about the rise of um, right-wing um, ideologies also in schools and uh, especially in social media in times of um, digitalization. 
Um, so my uh, perspective comes from one, on one hand post-colonial theory and on the other hand from uh, migration theory from a critical migration theoretical standpoint because there are very different migration studies that are done um, in Germany so I would uh, position myself in a kind of a critical migration theoretical frame and I'm very much interested also in the history of education in uh, Germany after the Second World War or after the overthrow of the uh, National Socialist uh, regime, because I think we can't uh, understand uh, the education and the problems that um, education we are uh, faced in education without looking into history and how this um, history is told also. And furthermore, I'm very much interested in the entanglement um, of um, colonialism and also anti-Semitism and the consequences this has um, in school, in teaching, um, when we talk about the curricula, but also when we talk about the didactics. Thank you, Maria. Your, your work sounds fascinating. It's timely, and if you set us up perfectly to move forward for the next a little bit less than an hour, we'll I'll just pose some very broad questions to the panelists, and then we will make sure that we leave ample time for questions from the audience. So I just want to start with the first question, and it's very broad. It's based in some way off of what Maria has just said, the importance of history. So if all of you could tell us about the historical efforts to address racism and related social inequities in schools in Germany and also in the US. And then because I am still an academic, it's a two part, and I'll give you the second part, but I'm happy to repeat it. Uh, and could you talk about how these influence how these influence the ways in which each country is currently experiencing and addressing related contemporary issues. So the historical look, and then how you see that influencing uh, contemporary education in both countries. Who would like to start? This is Adrian. I, I can't speak to the German context. I can just speak to the US context. And I'll say that um, that I don't know that we've ever addressed racism in public education in general. Um, we've addressed segregation. Um, we've addressed um, access, but we've never explicitly named racism as the culprit. Um, and as we see now with the you know kind of efforts to um, ban CRT um, and, and ban books. Just today I read that um, there's a school district, I think in Tennessee that banned mouse, um, the book mouse um, by a, a you know, unanimous vote 10 to, 10 to zero. Um, and so uh, again, we've never kind of addressed explicitly racism. Um, we've kind of danced around it, but we seem to be allergic to, as a nation, um, allergic to um, explicitly naming racism as a as a as a culprit for um, kind of long-standing and historical inequity, um, and uh, so so I, I just don't think we've we've been there yet, and and we're not comfortable. Um, it, it appears to even trying to name that and address it. Thank you, Kevin. Do you want to go next? So we we do the U.S. context first. Yeah, Not absolutely. First, but... you. Um, my, my comments in many ways echo what uh, Adrian has mentioned. Um, I think the challenge that we have in the United States has been one that's longstanding. When we think about the history of education in the United States, uh, we have to think first and foremost with the notion that education or schooling or even reading and knowledge was in fact denied to Black people from the outset. It was literally um, something punishable by death for those that were enslaved. And I think that idea around education as being something that is illegal or rather something that is not possible um, because of the power dynamics that are associated with it. To understand education in the United States as it has been um, articulated, at least in policies, that education is a direct link to being a citizen, to being understood as a human being who then has rights as a citizen. And so when we think about the history of education in the United States, it's always been bracketed 
by a larger ontological question about who can be involved, who can be included within this larger franchise or within this larger project of humanity. And so the issues that we see happening today around critical race theory, in fact, are a type of historical switch point, we can say, where the moments of the past seamlessly move into the moments of the present. So the things that we thought were past or over were things that were no longer a part of who we are is actually part and parcel to who we are as a nation and how the nation articulates itself and articulates the notion of uh, the citizen. And so th the challenge that we see facing us today is part of, I think, as um, Sam Bell talks about, is this idea of the politics of forgetting. Um, so we don't want to remember history. We don't want to remember um, all of the things um, that are the terrors and horrors associated with uh, white supremacy and objection. So, you know, Jill, when I think about this question, um, this is really a, a question about how we might solidify power and how policy has purposely worked to conserve um, white supremacy across time and space. And so when I think about this, similar to what uh, Dr. Dixon has mentioned, I don't think that at, from a state level, we've actively worked to um, challenge white supremacy or racism. We have attempted to um, address segregation with the Brown decision in 54, but we also realized following Brown that that notion of all deliberate speed also uh, in many ways effectively removed any power that the decision had, so much so that schools are more segregated today in 2022 than they were in 1954. So we, we have some challenges before us, and these challenges are longstanding, um, and these challenges are part of, I think, the fabric um, of the United States. And so what we, I think, partly in critical race theory aim to do is to undo the, those, that stitching um, that often holds people of color, and specifically Black people, in the straitjackets of white supremacy. Thank you. Well spoken. Lisa and Maria, would you like to talk to us about the German context? Sure, I can start and maybe Maria, you can um, come in then. So when when we hear about, you know, racial systemic inequities, um, it is similar in Germany, they have not really been addressed um, in the last years. Um, when we look at Germany today, more than 26% of the population in Germany has a statistically attributed migra migration background. Um, for children under the age of five, it is even more than 40%. So what do I mean by migration background? So instead of using terms like race or ethnicity, in Germany, we often talk about this term migration background. And this has to do with Germany's past and the misuse of the term race during the Holocaust. And uh, I'm sure, Maria, you can talk even more about this. Um, but um, this label migration background is defined as um, any person that immigrated to Germany or German born foreigners and persons born in Germany um, who have at least one parent um, who is a foreigner in the country. And in some cities now, in some larger cities, more than 50% of the residents now have a migration background. But um, efforts to address this diversity and the related social inequities in schools um, have, has not really developed as it should have been by now. And this can be explained by the historical development. So um, when we think about the 1960s and the guest workers and families coming to Germany, um, there was a so-called education for foreigners. Um, it was it was essentially defined as temporary as everyone thought those guest workers and their families would leave at some point. Um, and the strategy that dominated in schools was to address the so-called deficits of the children of migrant workers, and um, in particular, their um, not sufficient knowledge of the German language was supposed to be reduced. And other educational strategies were mainly of a compensatory nature. And um, this deficit approach and the special education for foreigners was uh, getting more and more criticized than later on in the 1980s. However, more changes only came a whole lot later. So since I told you that I look at the perspective from refugee and immigrant backgrounds and also um, the idea of, of, of integration, then um, the idea of an 
that Germany is actually an immigration country came only after 2005. So it's very, very recent and it's very different from the United States. So um, in 2007, a national integration plan was set in place and um, that highlighted the necessity of collective efforts to facilitate basically the integration of immigrants into the German society. Around this time, in the early 2000s, there was, in addition to that, the so-called PISA shock um, in Germany. So um, that was that um, after the international student um, assessment test by the OECD came out, um, Germany um, realized that um, educational opportunities for young people with a migrant background um, um, were highly unfair and it became a focus of a larger public debate at that point because it really confirmed that um, the German school system is more selective and stratifying and academic success depends on the social and ethnic background of a student much more than in other um, industrialized and comparable countries. And um, causes for this are debated until today. So um, people say it's a lack of the um, German, uh, German language, it's the socioeconomic background of the students. Um, others claim it's a multi-tier um, uh, school system in Germany that contribute to these problems. Um, other, re other reasons were seen that um, in the federal education system, similar to the US, you know, we have um, education policy is, is, is in charge of the, of the individual states and um, each state have a different support system and programs. However, um, this PISA results were definitely not discussed as a matter of racial systemic inequities. And a last point I wanna make is um, that also led to diversity and to the debate was the influx of refugees that came in in 2015 and 2016. And um, the German, Germany and you know, ad, ad, administrative practices, infrastructure, and especially the education system was not prepared for the high influx of the refugees. And since school attendance in Germany is compulsory, children, refugee children were supposed to be in school within six months after arrival and so-called separate welcome classes were installed um, that offered, for example, in language intensive classes for those refugee students and whether that was helpful or not is still debated until today. And um, one big problem was that teachers were not prepared. So there was a lack of qualified teachers and there was just a lack of a number of the numerical amount of teachers. Um, some even came off out of retirement for this. And at that point in 2016, I was part of a group to teach trainers for educators and we focused on trauma sensitive teaching, identity and cultural sensitive practices as well as language because it was much needed at that point. And um, overall, until today, many schools struggle to bridge the immigrant and refugee student previous education with that received then in the German classroom and to offer actually individual support for them. And lastly, I just want to highlight that um, un until today, um, a comprehensive adaptation to the requirements of an, a diverse society, of an immigration society, despite several like individual and initiatives and attempts has not taken place. And I guess it's still ought to be more on the agenda um, upcoming up, yeah, today. Um, that was like a historic, uh, uh, show in a, in a really yeah, dense way, but I just wanted to paint the picture, especially for the American audience. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And then we'll hear from Maria. I also want to acknowledge and, and thank our German colleagues for um, presenting today in English, which, you know, Lisa Delpit has told us long ago is the language of power and also we know of many colonizers. So th th thank you, Maria. <laughs> 
Thank you for mentioning that because it's always like um, really a struggle also to speak in a language which is not your first language, also not your first academic language. You can have a lot of different first languages, but um, uh, when it's not your academic language, one always has to, to struggle and always feels like one fails in saying what one really wants to say. But uh, let me say that uh, there were like several points which I uh, would um, um, say um, uh, thank you to Lisa for mentioning them, but also uh, thank you to uh, Kevin and Adrian to making the point that in the US, uh, racism is still not addressed at all or not addressed the way it should be if you really follow a framing of a critical race theory. I'm saying that because um, in Germany for a long time, and I think until today, um, the US is kind of a model. So we think uh, a lot of people in different institutions, um, educational institutions, think that we should follow the model of um, the US. And I think um, and, uh, there are some things where I would agree upon and then there are others not. I'm more interested in really in the entanglement and in how um, we, we could, if we look historically at education, we can see like some intersections um, um, in the history of it, in focusing on education in the US and in Germany. One, and I'm not saying that because today is the, um, International uh, Remembrance Days of, uh, of the Holocaust, but because I think um, even if it would not be this day, it is very, very important to remember that um, the Germany, I mean, in Germany, the way we know it as the Federal Republic of Germany um, started with the end of the um, Nazi regime. And, with, and it was, and one of the core topics was um, the, uh, the, the thing of how to re-educate or how to educate a society that morally failed. I mean, I, I mean, it was like, you know, like millions of people supported the national socialist tyranny. And after that, one really had to think of how to re-educate um, the, the whole society. So, and we have to remember that already in the 30s, the... Um, Institute for Social Research, which started in Frankfurt and had to uh, go into exile. So like there were refugees then in the US because they were Jewish intellectuals like uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, started to already think of how to um, implement an education that could really, um, um, would be able to um, produce citizens, which were um, not racist, not anti-Semitic, and able to um, live and, and to form a, a, a democratic uh, society. And um, that was not something that was like um, an easy task. And we had like, I mean, on a theoretical level, uh, especially Adorno and Horkheimer, but also Eric Fromm, they were all in the US and they were all um, not only working with um, colleagues in, in the US, but um, there were also um, writing in English and uh, it was like very often then as translated into German, which is very, very important. And, and they worked on a philosophical level, they worked on a, um, a psychological level and so on. Interestingly enough, uh, the, um, the allies and uh, US being one of those, um, use the US as a model for a good democratic um, education. I'm saying that because we are talking here about uh, 48 and the 50s. That means that in the US, we still had a completely segregation in the school system. This was never addressed. It was always said like the US has like this democratic educational model and um, Germany should somehow follow this model without seeing that um, actually there were also a lot of things in the educational uh, system in the US of the 50s, and it's still now, but in the 50s, uh, we are talking about another time, um, which um, I would say we should never follow. Um, and this is very, very interesting entanglement um, if, if you look at, at the different sides. So then 
The other thing, and uh, Lisa already mentioned it, we have still in Germany a three uh, ties um, education. That means that we have three schools which were actually designed for three classes. I mean, in the sense of class structure. So we have one school which forms, is like an educational formation for those who will then later be workers. They only should work with their bodies. And um, then we have a, a, a middle school, which um, is thought for those who will be then later um, like kind of the, 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 the bourgeois or the, the little bourgeois classes, which work in administration and so on. And then we have like the third school, which is also longer than the other ones. So, so the schooling is then 12 or 13 years and not 10 years only. Um, then they will be prepared then for studying and this, they are like thought of, I mean, their future thought of being the elite of the country. Already after the Nazi regime, a lot of um, people who were discussing that, there were like commissions discussing them said that we should undo that because that might be also one of the reasons and sources for um, the Nazi ideology having such a power that we already separate people at such young age, already with uh, 10 years, they are separated into this uh, different uh, schools. And um, for a lot of um, kids, then they don't have the possibility then to enter the university because already with 10, they're put in a school, which makes them very, very tough to then later be able um, to enter a university. So somehow there is already the, the destruction of a kind of, of a future already. And, and Ulrich Beck, a very famous uh, German sociologist said that actually this um, school, which are thought of to produce then workers um, is actually um, uh, an institution of non-education. So there is no education happening. And I think that if we compare that with the US system where we don't have this three tires um, um, education, but as you um, uh, already remarked, we have schools uh, where not all the students are prepared at the same at the same way with the same possibilities then after ending the, the schools because the, the framing, the curricula, the way to teach the didactics uh, is not somehow um, um, able to somehow address the diversity also in school and the, the different histories which are there and so on. So I think it's very, very fundamental that we, I also call it always the, the goals that hunts us in educational institutions are looked upon. And then um, thinking about today, again, we have to see that um, migration, the way that we know it now in Germany, starts in the 50s, in, indeed with the um, influx of um, so-called guest workers. I always laugh about the, 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 and other people in other parts of the country found it also funny, you know, that you have workers that you call guest workers. Anyway, uh, they anyway had to work. Um, and that the school system was never prepared for that because they always thought that, um, and this is very interesting, the different storytelling um, when, we when we think about the nation state. So that is the storytelling in Germany. We are a, still, we are a homogeneous um, population and migration or uh, also people who come as refugees are somehow disturbing this homogeneous idea of the nation state. So there are like the, the idea of a very homogeneous idea of, 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 of the citizenry. So they are all white, of course, which was never the case in Germany, not before uh, the Nazi regime, not during the Nazi regime, and of course not after the Nazi regime. We always had also people of color and, and, and black people living also in Germany. Uh, think only about uh, Du Bois, who was there uh, shortly before the Nazi regime. He again came um, during the Nazi regime also. And um, he also wrote about that. It, it's, it's, it's a very um, interesting history, also the entanglement of um, different um, uh, people also coming, especially to, to Berlin and the discussion that they led. Anyhow, so um, this is something where the, the German education institution, the schools also really struggle with, with the, the, the indeed heterogeneous um, 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 
pupils and students in school and the idea of uh, which is still an idea of in school um, are uh, white uh, bourgeois um, uh, students and the curriculas and the didactics and, and the way of the, the, the school instruction is only addressing this kind um, of students. Plus, we have to struggle, we have really, really problems with uh, especially anti Muslim uh, racism, now more and more also anti Asian um, racism, um, which is and and of course uh, um, the um, um, racism addressed to uh, people of color and um, and uh, black uh, students, which until now is not addressed at all. And I fear that um, talking about uh, diversity somehow uh, doesn't address the the real problem namely the racist structure and sometimes also the, the internalized uh, racism of the teacher staff. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Maria. I wanna acknowledge uh, the question by Dr. Gail Henson in the Q&A. I will promise to return to that in um, the last question I posed to the panelists. It seems to fit there. But before I do that, um, heard very, you know, very rich and in a diversity of, of ideas across the panelists. And I'm wondering if I could just invite the four of you to engage with each other around um, the comparison of perspectives that we've now heard. And if there's anything you'd like to ask the others or, or say. Sure, yeah, I, I, um, I want to thank the panelists for um, their comments regarding the German context. I, I think one of the things, um, as I was listening to what was said, was th the thought about a, a traveling policy um, and how policy moves and shifts across time and space. And, and in fact, um, when we think about, given that it is Holocaust Remembrance Day, and thinking about the German context and, and what Germany may have perhaps even learned um, from the United States, I think if I, if memory serves me correctly, one of the things that was very clear uh, with respect to the Holocaust and, and the persecution of Jews and all sorts of um, folks is, is that much of what the Nazis learned also came from the United States, right? They actually, in many ways, took up the mantle of white supremacy um, from the United States in, in ways that were not unique uh, to how we understand um, policy and how we understand the subjugation of groups that are seen to be lesser or in fact not even needed for the state or needed for the, the constitution of uh, the state. And so for me, I also heard, and I believe it was Lisa mentioning these notions of assimilation. And part of the project, it seems uh, that the state, both that the German, the German state as well as the United States the state of the is is to try to create a type of being a type of humankind that fits within the parameters uh, or dictates of capital that fit the parameters and dictates of white supremacy and so those things seem to be cross cutting um, and and in such a way that um, the the ultimate goal then is to create a particular strata of citizens or perhaps non-citizens um, that do not have the opportunity to fully participate in the governance of a state or in the governance of a country, uh, but more precisely, who serve as a type of um, underground group of folks who um, are part of the kind of subaltern. And so for me, I think what's really interesting, um, and it kind of relates to the question that was asked in the um, chat or rather the comment that was made in the chat, I, I think part of what we have to think about as it relates to, for instance, the addressing of racism is not merely what the state does, but what people beyond the state have tried to do to attempt to rectify and address um, some of the, the, the pronounced issues that impact, uh, in the, certainly in the United States, black and brown and other minoritized and marginalized communities. That is to say, if we understand the history of education in the United States, most of the, the challenges that have taken place to racism have actually been by communities that have been marginalized and left out and left behind. And so I think that is a way for us to rethink um, the curricular challenges and erasures uh, 
to rethink the policy absences and uh, utterings that leave people muted, is to think about what people did to respond to uh, their erasure, to respond to the constraints. And we can see, for instance, certainly during chattel slavery, African-Americans, Black people during this time, they weren't African-Americans actually, Black people during this time, um, created schools, clandestine schools out of nothing. We see, we can see this with um, um, September Clark and the Freedom Schools. We can see this with independent Black institutions that sprung up all around the United States. Those are the things, even the Panther Schools, the Black Panther Schools, those were things that were attempts to remedy and address that. So I think in general, um, I, I, the, the, the scope and scale of white supremacy as a technology means that it's always advancing, that it's always moving across borders. Um, and so it seems to me while we have different contexts, the context that ultimately shapes it or the weather as um, Christina Sharp talks about that shapes us is this weather of white supremacy. And I think those logics around colonialism, around exclusion, around extraction and dispossession are things that um, seem to travel quite frequently without a passport across um, locales um, here and there. Uh, and I'll try to be brief because I know we want to um, take some time to answer questions that folks may have posted. Um, I'm interested in what um, Morrison calls the absent presence, right? So uh, again, kind of the refusal to name racism um, to name white supremacy as culprits in ways that we've marginalized people. And I think that's kind of similar. Um, I, I can't remember if it was Lisa or Maria talking about the um, students, um, uh, the quote unquote migrant students, right? It's, a, it's another euphemism. Um, and yet they're treated in racialized ways, but, we, but, but on both sides, right, of the, of, uh, in, in of these countries that we in, in the U.S. and in Germany and probably across Europe, just unwilling to name um, again racism and um, uh, white supremacy that clearly operate. And again, Morrison calls it the absent presence is there, but we we refuse to name it um, and we'll give it another name. So we'll um, you know call kids migrants or um, we'll say. Um, kids from single parent families in the US or um, kids on free and reduced lunch. Um, but we pay families that live in poverty. But if we look more closely at the data, it falls pretty clearly on who, who are the marginalized populations. And so um, again, when we refuse to name things, it's difficult to um, address and um, think about policy interventions that will be meaningful and um, without sounding conspiratorial. And if someone looks at conspiracy theories, but without sounding conspiratorial, um, it's, uh, you know, there, I, I think um, at least we're seeing in the US, there's a, a real reluctance um, and a refusal, not even a reluctance to name anything um, as, as being racist or having white supremacist um, um, linkages, even the um, attack on our U.S. Capitol, um, again, refusing to name it as an example of white supremacist domestic terrorism. Um, so, um, and, and that, you know, manifested now, that action has kind of seeped into our schools where, um, again, we have these attacks on anti-racism, we have attacks on um, naming anti-Semitism, um, and, uh, and so uh, just again, the kind of the, the, the absent presence of, of racism and white supremacy. Uh, and so I'm, I'm fascinated both, you know, in Germany and in the US context, how we, um, with our really troubled and violent histories, racial, racially violent histories that we, again, as a national, almost a national policy, right? Refuse to name it. I mean, the, the challenge that we're having in the US um, with even, holding people accountable for such an egregious act that happened on um, January 6th. We're, you know, um, afraid to name people as violent white supremacist domestic terrorists um, to hold them accountable, to bring them in. Um, it, it's, it's stunning. I, I would imagine internationally, it's, it's shocking to see how long it's taken to bring folks to justice for, um, for what happened. Thank you both Kevin and Adrian. 
Lisa and Maria, do you have anything that um, you'd like to say before we move to um, a related but a bit of a slight shift in our engagement? I just want to echo, I think, what Maria said earlier that in Germany, um, I believe it is often, well, it is not, um, there's a reluctance to talk about racism, but there's also like in schools, um, the inequities have become so internalized, whether it's the teachers or the school system, it's become institutionalized. So I think a lot of people don't want to or might not even realize certain things that are actually racist or in, unequal in the schools. And that's why there was what I mentioned earlier, this big PISA shock that actually showed, actually researched data that there is, you know, inequity in German schools. There is, there, it is not fair. And that's why it was such a big shock. And it's, and that was only, you know, it was not that long ago, if you think about it. So, um, and then it actually dropped again in the public debate since then. So I, I, I really truly think it's, it's, it's so um, institutionalized that it's gonna be really hard to break and change, yes. Yes, and I think we have to, I mean, that there are a lot of similarities and there are also a lot of differences. I don't think that one can, you know, equate uh, the history of the United States with uh, Germany. It's, it's really different and it's true. I mean, for example, one can say that it's really hunted by the uh, extreme violence that uh, is part of the nation building. And uh, it's kind of, you know, where it is built upon. Um, and this also shows in the educational system. And that goes, for example, I mean, this one of the consequences that it is very difficult to talk about it for some people. So to talk about like, you know, directly without circumventing, like saying it is racism we are talking about, it is anti-Semitism we are talking about. We are not talking about people are uh, just treated differently but it's violence that we are like, um, you know, observing here and that it should be also named. Now, I think that um, white supremacy and racism is a very, very important um, form of uh, violence in schools, but it is of course, um, I mean, supplemented or intersects uh, to say it better with other forms also of uh, violence. And one which I think it's very important to talk about it because people think it's like over, it's uh, like really um, the class um, oppression. So we have like, I mean, schools are really, um, um, several schools in Germany, the ones which are the best schools in Germany are just not um, made and prepared and not inviting and not even wanting um, um, students which are from um, proletarian classes. And that somehow intersects also with um, the, 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 the problematic um, issue of, um, of migration because uh, the migrants that came in the 50s, they came to work in the US. So they are really from proletarian classes. So, and if this, if you look into this intersection that then you see like quite um, a very, very, um, problematic and also really violent picture of um, the German um, educational um, system. And you can then see it also statistically, if you look at it, who then reaches the university. So the numbers of, um, for example, migrant students with a proletarian background in the universities is like really, really low. You know? And then you have another problem once inside the institution, then um, there is a very manifest uh, racism there. And um, it's, it's very interesting how difficult it was um, in Germany to really implement something like um, to study racism in the university, because there was, it's, it's not that there were no experts who wanted to talk about it, but that there was like the institution really refused to fund research on racism and all, which is somehow contradicts the whole idea 
um, that um, and discussions also that we found historically then in the 50s um, to say how do we uh, somehow educate people who can then um, support um, a democracy and how like really democratic um, democratic um, citizens. Um, and the other point um, that uh, Kevin, you may have found it very, very interesting because there is no such um, history in Germany. There are these um, schools that come from the uh, civil society somehow uh, opposing the, the, the non-education given by the state. So this is something we, uh, we can see that, um, and we talk a um, uh, big deal about it, that uh, people who then later are politicized and then they build up schools, for example, for uh, refugees, which are called, for example, in Zurich, I know it in Switzerland, it's like uh, the um, uh, autonomous um, school for refugees, which is like a, a political entity. It's outside the, the, the state because they say the state is not taking care um, of um, these people to, to give them the education that they need to then really build up a, a, a future. But we don't have that in the way that uh, the, the, the story of uh, history of uh, the US have it in the um, uh, Black Power movement. And I mean, it's like the, the Black Panther school. I, I found it very fascinating. That, that, that way we, we don't have uh, that. But we have, of course, um, social movements, migrant social movements, um, uh, social movements from uh, BIPOC uh, people who are really now changing the discourse they're really they are getting really power to intervene into the discourse so that the universities and also the um, institutional um, the, 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 the institutions of education are forced to address the questions and now are taking up like um, ideas of diversity and of plurality and um, are starting to talk about a racism the way it should be. But um, I think that like uh, what I want to say is like there are some similarities, but there are also some difference. Another point that I would be very interested in also to talk about is, of course, uh, um, the um, migrating uh, or the migration of theories and what happened to them. So what happened to a critical race theory, which, you know, um, um, is really um, um, started in, in the US with the history of the US, with certain people with, with uh, certain interests also, with certain also experiences, when it lands in Germany, what happens to this theory? Because I have the feeling um, that it, what happens is that the really radical angle gets lost. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's it's not because it, then it becomes somehow a, um, a, a research perspective, <laughs> which, it is, it can also be, but it's, of course, much more than that, you know, and this I found quite uh, fascinating. Thank you to all of the, the panelists. Um, we have several questions in the Q&A. Also, some people are putting it in the chat. I think we will segue with a linkage from what was going to be our last question. Um, and I think that will encompass some of these um, participant questions. So we want to talk about, okay, now that you've laid out this situation so eloquently for all of us, and maybe disturbingly, um, what are we going to do now? Right? What resources supports collaborations? Uh, what, if any, is thing is going on to actually address these? So I want to tie in to that. Think about that for a moment, panelists. I want to tie in this first question um, from Dr. Gail Henson. So Gail says, teaching about race and ethnicity is a multi-dimensional issue. To say that public education doesn't address race and power is unfortunate. I speak as a career educator, having served on the local board of education for an urban system with 100,000 students, the state board of education with 170 districts, and then on national boards. Standards for teaching about the history of enslaved people, the plantation systems, and other abuses are clearly stated as is the case with most districts. The standards may be there, but how the teachers teach them varies with the district. Some dis districts have teachers make up their own content to teach to the standards. Others have books. Being at the table when textbooks are written and adopted is one thing citizens and educators could do. 
I would say the desire to teach all components of state or national required standards is there, but the capacity may or may not be there. And then also let me add one more um, question that I think relates by Douglas McGitchin. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Um, he's talking about reform. Jennifer Bennett asked about what reform is being done. Some reform is being done in the US, uh, what's also being done in Germany. So again, back to the broader question panelists, what should we do as educators, as activists, as humans? Uh, as parents, and what should we do? I'll, I'll take a stab at that question. Um, I think the the thing that we should do, uh, the first thing we should do is be angry. Um, we should be angry and we should be concerned about the state uh, of the nation and the state of what constitutes being a part of this nation. And what I mean to suggest there is that what we see happening in the United States is tantamount um, to a, a type of fascism that is fomenting and happening um, in our country. And so we need to really take issue with that and call it what it is, right? The fact that there are these attacks on critical race theory, or tech, the fact that there are attacks on gender, around transgender issues, the fact that you can't, I believe in Florida, there's a bill that just passed that says you can't say gay Right. These are attacks that are coordinated and these are efforts that, in fact, have been funded, for instance, by the Heritage Foundation, the Trump Victory Fund. So understanding those political linkages um, and understanding that what we see happening is that as we understand it, democracy is under attack and forms of knowledge construction are under attack. In other words, as we understand what is true and what might be real, is under attack. And once that's lost, we have uh, a great amount of risk at hand. In fact, we see that these risks, we see incidents of um, racial violence have increased. We see incidents of domestic violence against women have increased. These things are not some abstract ideas. These are the realities that shape people's lives and shape the future of our country. So I think that we need to you know, be big little people and, and, and pick up uh, the pieces that are right in front of us. But I think the second thing I'll say um, in terms of what this actually means. And I think of Miles Horton, who was one of the leaders of the Highlander Folk School, who trained many civil rights leaders in the United States. And he says, the people with the problem are the people with the solution. So we need to start looking, and in the words of critical race theorists, we need to start looking to the bottom, to folks who have, um, are experiencing this, who know from their experiential knowledge, from their academic knowledge, from their lived realities, what's happening, and we have to listen. We can't stonewall, we can't act as if these things don't exist. We not only have to listen, but we have to do something about it. And lastly, the thing I would say is that we are all in community with each other. These efforts that are taking place are large scale and often funded by organizations that have lots and lots of money. And so part of what we need to be doing is working collectively and within our communities to address these issues. Teachers, parents, unions, everyone has to be on board, all hands on deck. We can't do this alone. And if we really want to think about any change that has taken place in the United States, it's because of a movement. And so we really have to be working towards building a movement to challenge these things, not in our isolated academic institutions or beyond the ivory tower, but beyond the ivory towers and also within the communities. And so I think for me, you know, that's a large scale response to a large scale issue. Um, we can't just, it's not just me adding one book in the curriculum or saying that I want to do this one thing in my classroom. Certainly we should be doing those things, but we have to think about this as a large scale issue because this is a macro issue that has micro realities. And so um, I would say that we need to collectively be together, be working on this together across contexts. And I think it's important that we're having this conversation, not only with American or US scholars, but with German scholars, because this is, this is in fact, as we saw um, during the Trump era, these are national and international issues um, that have crossed, crossed the seas. And so we have to be working on this together because those that are interested in undermining democracy, undermining difference um, are working coordinated as well. Thank you. And yeah. I want to also just acknowledge that uh, one of the participants has said, yes, we all need to do this work and yet we're all so exhausted. So I, I want to put that out there as well. Um, may I move on to, to gather a couple other 
um, questions or was it Adrian, someone wanted to say something else? I, I was just gonna echo what Kevin said and, and to think about kind of there are um, movements, there are formations in our cities and often uh, folks are organizing um, out, out of sight um, in part because of what Kevin said, there are folks that are on the bottom. So there are workers groups that are organizing in New Orleans. Um, it's almost unaffordable. Um, it's not almost, it is unaffordable to live here. And yet it's a city that um, services everyone's pleasure. So when you come to New Orleans, um, you expect to go to restaurants and to hotels and um, you should know that that the people who service you in those places can't afford to, literally can't afford to live in the city. Um, and, uh, but workers are organizing. Um, the wisdom was that they would fight for $15 an hour. Well, that's just not enough to live and to raise your family. And in a city like New Orleans, there's no social safety net. It's a red state. And, um, and systematically, um, Republicans have removed almost every social safety net um, from, uh, for, for those who, um, who would need that. So, um, for those of us who are, you know, have the, the good fortune of being in, um, the academy, we can look to the bottom at those kind of workers' rights, labor organizing, um, not just with teachers, but encouraging our teachers to, um, reach across and work with families, um, uh, who are, you know, laboring to, uh, get, a livable wage to um, have affordable housing um, to um, eradicate food deserts. All those things should matter to educators. Um, and those are issues that we can organize around that disproportionately impact kids of color. So when they say that most kids of color live in poverty, those kids are in families. <laughs> they have mothers, they have caregivers, they have fathers, they have aunties, they have grandmas um, who are underpaid for the work that they do to the extent that they can't help to care for their families. And so those, those are issues that we can coalesce around um, and address. And, and we have to move beyond uh, kind of thinking that we'll find the perfect candidate who will address these issues. It's, it's demanding that they happen. And again, move beyond marches. Our, our kind of political agitation and organizing has to think beyond we're going to go and march, you know, on the Capitol um, and be smart. I'm not an organizer, but I, I have a lot of organizing friends. And one of the things they're frustrated by is the lack of um, engagement with uh, from educators and from university folk that we really are out of touch with workers' rights issues. Um, we may get mad when Sodexo comes on campus, but there are things outside of our campus that um, folks are impacted by, and um, and certainly those are those are things that we should be concerned about. So the collective piece is very important, but making sure that we understand where those collective actions are happening. Thank you so much for that. I'm just uh, to to be mindful of time. I'm going to take three of the questions in the Q and A and put them together. I don't mean any disrespect by that. They're each, you know, each of them is actually quite um, substantive. So Gary Schmidt, Naomi Moland, and Douglas McGetchen are really, you've piqued their interest panelists. So congratulations about the influence of what's going on in Germany and the US. And so uh, just to distill these, um, you know, has the US learned anything um, from the way in which Germany has addressed the Holocaust? Has Germany uh, learned anything or taken anything from the civil rights movement or Black Lives Matter now? And then we see a lot of what uh, Naomi's calling backlash here in the US, um, you know, against CRT, against any trans positive initiative. And we're wondering if you see that in Germany. And then the final piece, I believe, is a question about xenophobia. And so is xenophobia um, equivalent to, analogous with, used similarly uh, in Germany as, it, as racism is used in the US? So that's a bunch of questions I'm going to, to throw out there. And if we could take you know, we can take 15 minutes to engage in this. And then I'd uh, like to invite back um, Annika and Rose. Okay, let, let me just pick up 
like one or two points. Um, um, well, thank you for the questions. Um, I, I think uh, in Germany, the xenophobia is, from my perspective, a problematic term, because this is exactly the term that was used for not to talk about racism. So we talk about xenophobia, but it's not uh, racism. And for a long, long time, um, it was only um, possible to talk about xenophobia, which is, is it's such a very problematic term and coming from, from Greek, it's like to have fear from those who are uh, different, you know, uh, Xenos, uh, the one who are the, the strangers. And then it becomes really interesting, who is the stranger here? And uh, why should, the, should you be, you know, have um, fears um, um, about uh, being uh, to, to, um, against uh, strangers? Uh, because actually the ones um, who are living in Germany and who are marked as strangers are the one who should be scared um, of the majority. It's the other way around. So I, I think this is um, a very problematic thing. In Germany, um, the, there is no banning of talking about um, critical race theory, but there is something very interesting happening and I, I'm still not really understanding what is happening. But um, on one hand, there is a hype. So all of a sudden, everybody talks about post colonial theory, everybody talks about critical race theory, everybody talks about, I don't know, all kinds of critical terms, which are not so new, but somehow they are like, talked about as if they were extremely new. And on the other hand, that is, um, that is like a, a block forming against it. So to say that now that everybody talks about critical race theory, we can't talk anymore. We are not allowed to talk anymore because everything is seen as racist. Everything is seen also when we talk about anti-Semitism, about is uh, seen as anti-Semitic and somehow we are silenced. So the majority is like saying, actually, we are silenced because now we are called um, racist and uh, anti-Semitic. I guess as far as I know, the US, it, there are similar movements and dynamics also. But in, in Germany, they are rather new and quite violent also. So in discussions um, and what we have seen now during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, because I started to talk uh, to research conspiracy theories, because there you find all kinds of anti-Semitic and also very violent uh, racist tropes that it's somehow um, ventilated this whole, um, uh, I don't know, this whole aggression against um, uh, critical race theory and also against um, a critical um, uh, talking about anti-Semitism in, you know, packed in conspiracy theory now during the, uh, the pandemia, which I found very scary. That's why I think, and I want to second that, that it's very, very important that uh, we get angry and I think patient and impatient at the same time. We should stop to be patient sometimes with, you know, and, and constantly trying to um, explain because a, a lot of people already know, but they just don't want to know. So, which is a, is a, is a different kind of, of thing. But on the other hand, to change um, people's idea of what is normal, of what how the world should be is a very, very difficult task. So it, it takes time. So, and it takes also um, um, a lot of power. I especially, I uh, myself like very much the, um, uh, the definition of uh, Gaitri Spivak of education as an uncoercive rearrangement of desires. So that we really see how can we rearrange desires and that we see that education also has to do with ethics, you know, and not only with information and knowledge production, but also with the production of an ethical um, um, subject and how to, to really produce this ethical subject that in the right moment also intervenes when, for example, uh, racist uh, practices uh, happen or uh, when we see um, anti-Semitism or transphobia and so on. So that there are some ethical reflexes that really then work and this has to be uh, produced. So I myself for uh, in three years ago, no, four years ago now, 
um, formed also a group which we call uh, Bildungs Lab, it's like a laboratory for education. And these are all uh, people who are or of uh, color or migrants or sometimes both migrants and of color, um, and who are or um, in the context of art or in the art in the context of pedagogy. And my simple idea was that we also need um, somehow to rethink uh, pedagogical ideas and theories. And if people have made experience and have directly experienced racism and marginalization and stigmatization, they will come up with other uh, theories that we already know in history. But somehow inside the universities, in schools, this kind of knowledge production is somehow not uh, allowed. So you don't have the space to do so. So they're like stopped. So in this space, um, we are trying to come up with um, new um, theories with this really uh, standpoint positioning and really clear political positioning also. And one thing I want to say still about uh, poverty, because Germany is always seen as a, as a rich uh, state um, and also as a welfare state, which is still is also. One has to see that there is a real difference between Germany and uh, the United States. Having said that, we have to see that poverty is on the rise and that we have more and more uh, children coming to school without having breakfast, something as simple as that, and what that means for the, for the education. And I think that now with the COVID-19 pandemic, this will increase in the whole of Europe and in the US as also, so that we have to have also, um, not to uh, um, leave out of sight what is happening there, that more and more people um, are like, you know, pushed into poverty and will not be able to find housing here in Berlin. It's like really, it's, it's extreme how much uh, the, the um, housing um, costs um, rise. It's also the energy cost and so on. So I think we have to, again, um, talk more um, about uh, also uh, politics um, um, of class and the intersections with uh, um, racism. I, I want to thank you, Maria, for that. And I, and I want to um, kind of, I think the US context is important um, in terms of kind of um, how we should think about public education. And I think um, one of the challenges with um, um, kind of abstracting out context in the US, and, and we have not wrestled with this issue, is that we consigned human beings to being subhuman, that they didn't count as a human. We have not, we have not wrestled with that completely, right? Um, and so therefore we, there's a justification for poverty um, that um, is, is, has historical links. Um, and so if one is impoverished, it is their fault. Um, and that there is no, I mean, we really have these really um, very strict, I, ideologies that will prevent intervention into, uh, uh, so we won't, we don't, uh, about eradicating poverty because it is your fault if you are poor. Um, and, and that is completely ahistorical, right? We, we as a nation refuse to address, um, again, historical roots of poverty that, that in some ways do cut across race. Um, but we, we refuse to address that. We refuse to address um, the accumulation of wealth as a, um, a and its historical um, roots and antecedents. And so on one hand, it's hard and, and, and kind of the, the ethics of education is also very subjective, right? Because it assumes that one is deserving and we have consigned whole populations of people as undeserving um, and undeserving of a certain kind of education and deserving and, and, and fit for a certain kind of education. So um, we have always kind of stratified what, what it means to be educated and, and what one should learn when they are. We had, and this isn't unique to the US, um, Australia, um, had a similar system, a caste system of educating based on the percentage of, you know, kind of white um, um, blood quantum, right? Um, it, it, uh, so, and we have, you know, 
we, we had a similar kind of practice here that was unstated, but it certainly um, existed almost in policy until the Brown decision. And so we, um, we struggle with um, educating people writ large. I mean, we're, you know, there, there's the Supreme Court is going to hear re, they're, they're relitigating the affirmative action um, policy. So, and here we are in 2022, still arguing about who, who is deserving of education, right? Um, and so while it's wonderful to kind of, you know, think philosophically about what public education should be in the US context, we still have issues with, again, who's deserving. And often that who is deserving um, is, is, match, is, is, um, is matched by race. Um, and and uh, so those are, you know, from a critical race theory perspective, we always talk about the historical context. We can't divorce our, our current public policies from our, from our history and the long history of, of racism that we have had um, and white supremacy um, in the US and, and how our policies are, are um, a reflection of white supremacist ideologies um, that cast whole groups, not just African-Americans, but whole groups of folks as subhuman and undeserving um, of anything that is um, what, what people kind of, you know, philosophize about. And I would like to add something to pick up the idea who is deserving. Also in Germany, um, we talked about the separation um, of the students into different school system um, with the concentration of, you know, of migrant young people at second secondary schools, you know, that don't um, let them go to universities afterwards as easily. You know, it also promotes the idea of a natural inequality according, you know, to, to the origin. So they also find themselves, you know, in subordinate positions and um, in a marginal um, social order where they, you know, develop certain self images, identities and form like a habitus. So um, the same of course applies for German children um, that would go to a different school, but in the different direction, so to say. So you have um, a positioning of, of, of students in different systems. And instead of um, that the school system, you know, breaks that up, it actually um, makes it stronger, so to say in Germany. So you have that, um, yeah that idea of who's deserving as, as Adrian was talking about um, into um, also thinking about, you know, we and others or above and below that is, um, yeah, increased by the school system is, and um, um, yeah, makes it makes a problem even stronger, I want to say, yes. Uh, Kevin, do you have anything to say before we turn it back to um, yeah. Amen. Amen to what was said. I think, um, I mean, it's very, it seems what, what seems most clear to me is that um, part of the, the work that we have to do as educators and part of the work that I think we have to do as citizens is to disabuse ourselves from the idea that schooling is somehow some salvific bomb to the problems that we have and more precisely understand the history of schooling as uh, part and parcel to the larger um, classification systems that exist um, that are rooted in white supremacy and chattel uh, slavery and, and um, essentially uh, settler colonialism, as well as understanding these systems as uh, part and parcel to a sorting mechanism that's used to determine um, all forms of advantage and disadvantage in the United States and elsewhere. And I think that um, becomes quite clear when we, we look at both the United States and German context um, that these, these systems are in place as a mechanism to enshrine, maintain, um, and in fact, enhance the power of those that currently have it. And so it's, it's a form of dispossession, it's a form of erasure, it's a form of silencing, um, and at base, it's a form of terror. And so I think we have to think about, uh, or at least holding in intention, the, the reality that as a mechanism, as an organizational institutional mechanism, these are some of the things that take place in schools and also understand at the same time that there are people, teachers, community members, folks that are trying to resist and rearticulate schools to be humanizing spaces for children 
um, that have often been seen as um, non-human as uh, Dr. Dixon has, has clearly uh, articulated. So I think, you know, this is this is the challenge. It's it's an ontological challenge. It's a political challenge, and it's a larger challenge about what we want to constitute, how we see ourselves, and how we see the world that we want to create. Um, and so it is, in fact, as well, an ethical challenge. And, and my concern is that if we look at the history, I'm a racial realist. Um, that history suggests that that ethical turn is, is has yet to come and may not yet come. And so we have to do something in the meantime and between time to create spaces that are worthy of the children that are in them. Thank you. With that, I'm gonna turn it back uh, to our two organizers and hosts. Yes, thank you. I think I'll take over then for, for some last remarks. Well, I think this uh, panel gave us a very good impression of how important the topic is and uh, how fruitful it can be to discuss it from different perspectives and uh, angles especially when we are able to compare the developments from two different countries that have many things in common, but also develop very differently in many ways, as we saw in this discussion. So thank you very much for that. And I'd like to use this opportunity to thank our panelists for sharing their thoughts with us, our moderator for navigating us through the session, and the German Center for Research and Innovation in New York for supporting and co-organizing the event. And of course, the audience for joining us tonight and engaging in, in the discussion of this topic. So before we finish, I'd like to invite everyone to participate in either one or both of our next two sessions in the series, which are at the end of February and at the end of March, on, edu on education for sustainable development and on digital education. And the invitations for these events will be sent around um, again. So for for now, I think it's, um, we wish you all a very nice rest of the day or evening. Thanks again. And from our side, it's goodbye to everyone. Thank you. To be continued. Thank you. Bye. Bye.